Thank you very much, Mathieu. And we now invite our first opponent, Bernhard Rieder, to join us virtually. Hello, Bernhard. Hello, can you hear me well? We can hear we you can. well. All right, well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, thanks, uh, um, Mathieu, for the, the presentation. Uh, this is indeed a, an interesting uh, techno-anthropological uh, situation that, we are, uh, that we're in here. Um, I mean, I want to uh, um, simply start by, you know, congratulating you for yeah, what I what I thought was a very impressive and really inspiring piece of scholarship. I, I really enjoyed reading it. Um, I also really enjoyed hearing your presentation now, um, both uh, uh, due to uh, the intellectual content, but I think also I really enjoyed the self-reflecting tone and uh, with the text, particularly the overall linguistic uh, quality. Um, there were a lot of, uh, I think, also very helpful and uh, insightful metaphors. So I thought just as a text for me, it, it really worked, uh, it really worked very well. Um, and, and I think that that really um, uh, that attention paid to formulation and to, you know, metaphors and so forth um, really showed uh, a desire to interpret, right, to in, engage in sense making, to communicate a, a, a thought process. Um, and obviously, there's also a lot of uh, visual richness and expressivity that I think, yeah, really supports the argument and also makes it uh, more uh, more palpable. So I think there's really, um, uh, yeah, like a whole, uh, uh, yeah, you know, like a, like a whole a series of things one could just say about, you know, the visual aspects of uh, of the thesis. But um, in terms of subject matter and approach, this is, of course, a, a, yeah, a, a pretty unusual thesis, right? Uh, it, it rests uh, on over a decade of active participation in the field of visual network analysis. And uh, yeah, that is a field that you have shaped in many ways, not only through Gephi and other software, but also as an author and uh, as a commentator. Um, and as a reader of your, of your blog, I noticed many recurring themes uh, in particularly the desire to account for your role as toolmaker, um, yeah, which I believe is not merely account giving, right, but the work of clarification and orientation for yourself, right. There is really, I think, uh, uh, when we read uh, uh, your thesis, you can you can you can really kind of feel the you know the work you you put into like like thinking for yourself through your own your own practice, taking yourself as an as an as an object of study in a sense and, and the tools you make. Um, and, and I think, yeah, in a situation where research software is playing an always larger role in knowledge production, this, this active engagement is, is, is highly valuable. Um, indeed, well, well, one of the papers that are part of the thesis is called Un Unblackboxing Gephi, uh, the one written together with uh, Emilia Jokobaskaite. I think the whole thesis can, at least from a certain angle, be understood as an exercise in unblackboxing, um, unblackboxing Gephi, unblackboxing visual network analysis, and uh, even more importantly, maybe unblackboxing toolmaking as motivated epistemic contribution, and in particular, as your motivated epistemic contribution, Mathieu. Um, but then I think this is where the metaphor of the black box really leads us astray. Uh, there is not simply some like pre-existing content waiting in the black box to be discovered or to be disclosed, um, but there is a practice of making and a practice of reflecting on making, and both are co-evolving over, over time. Um, I mean, given this emphasis on practice, I was a little bit surprised that you did not engage in more depth with Agra's notion of critical technical practice. Which, which I think would have made yeah, a great conversational partner, even if, of course, his field of application uh, AI is very, very different uh, from yours. But I think one of the key takeaways from your text is indeed the deep embeddedness of toolmaking. Um, you say that uh, uh, our scientific apparatus has been largely co-designed by its practitioners. And that means that the power of designers and engineers is much more embedded than, than often thought. Um, and the various kinds of embeddings are something that you dive in very deeply in the text. I mean, we've just seen in the in the uh, presentation, uh, you know, a whole range of connections. Um, but I think in particular, the connections with practitioners of visual network analysis through tools, workshops, collaborations, and so forth, play a very, uh, very important role. But there's also pretty serious engagement with different academic network, network fields. 
For example, when going into the shift from a diagrammatic to a topological interpretation regime, which you've uh, now uh, retraced, or when discussing the Lindlock model in, uh, in great uh, depth, or when studying epistemic clashes around uh, scale-free networks. I have to say, I, I, fully, I fully stepped into that trap uh, myself uh, at, uh, at one point in time. So I, I, I hope you'll, uh, you'll uh, help me with that at, uh, um, in, in the future. Um, yeah, I, I, I found these passages to be uh, really interesting and, and very, very pedagogical. So I really learned a lot from this like reconstruction of some of these um, of these elements, which uh, you know are very often really like hidden in um, in, in rather forbidding uh, forbidding texts. And I think you you succeed brilliantly in making them uh, accessible. I also found it both convincing. Uh, and helpful that you define visual network analysis from the start as a, as a practice and a practice that precedes a theory or theorization. Um, I mean, you do not draw on the German cultural techniques tradition, but I think that your perspective fits very well with the idea that techniques precede conceptualization, meaning that concepts and theories themselves are achievements and have to be crafted and worked out progressively. And I think this is really what you're, what you're doing here. Um, so, so you're presenting a conceptualization of visual network analysis and attempt to theorize it, to make it an, an object of uh, reflection. Um, and uh, yeah, one could say that the expression that you use to summarize the big data visualization noema, uh, there is an order to that chaos applies in a way to what you're trying to do for visual network analysis, right? To, uh, to make it more a more reflexive and a more robust practice um, and not just, uh, you know, something that happens quite uh, uh, hap haphazardly, um, you know, without, you know, without uh, uh, um, kind of reducing it to a positivistic practice of, you know, purely mathematical uh, uh, transformation. Um, so, for example, I think uh, the attempt to make force-driven layouts less of a mystery and more easy to talk about is really a, a, one, of the, one of several practical contributions. So, in that sense, I think that the whole thesis is an intervention and not only the two specific formal contributions that you actually name interventions, right? Um, it's an attempt to put visual network analysis on a more mature epistemological basis, I would say, although, you know, that term mature is maybe... Uh, uh, debatable. Um, not to transform the practice into a theory, but to work towards a more clearly and strongly conceptualized practice. And, and that brings me to uh, my, uh, my first question, uh, which is, yeah, which is maybe overly broad or, or a, a bit vague and, and maybe not so easy to answer, but um, it, 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 seems, it seems really central when, even if it's hard to articulate. So, so to put it very bluntly, I, I, I was asking you, know, what is this? And I don't know if you can see me. I'm, I'm, I'm holding your oh, yeah. thesis uh, print out. So what is this, right? Like what kind of text is it? Uh, because in academia, we often organize around like genres, right? And, and, and I've been wondering um, how and where this fits. I mean, it's clearly not a classic uh, science and technology studies thesis, you know, where you go in, into some lab or you study some technology project uh, like Latour did uh, with, uh, with uh, Aramis, for example. But, but it also clearly draws heavily on SDS uh, style uh, thinking. So, so what is the method used here for this text? How would you define your, like, your method as an, as an author here? Uh, what, is the, what is the model or, or is there even a model? Is this maybe a, like, like a new genre of uh, academic text? So, so where and how do you situate this work within academia? Uh, am I supposed to answer right now? Yeah, okay. Uh, that's, that's an excellent question. So I think that the first thing that must be said is that uh, I, have, I don't want to find an answer to that. I'm, I'm going to try, but um, I don't think it needs a genre. And I, I would even say that it was part of my initial endeavor, even though I must admit that while doing it, it my perspective on what it was and how it could work changed. But <clears throat> I think that I'm a, I'm, I mean, I'm a jack of all trades. I'm going to say something very practical and human, right? People write better than me. People do math better than me. People do development better than I. I mean, so I, what I have that I can 
propose that is new to people is the fact that I, it, I can traverse this chain from the math, the algorithm, the visual aspect, the uses, and I can navigate through that. So it's the transversality of the, the map mapping process, map making process itself that was in some way the object of this thesis. And this supposes, of course, um, a heavy dose of reflexivity. And I think that here STS gives all the, the engine that's necessary to address the multiplicity of these situations. So in that sense, that's why STS is the right place to root this case. But it's also, by construction, also a completely practical endeavor. And what's really powerful in the, the intellectual apparatus of STS to do these kind of things is that it challenges boundaries, dichotomies, that else would be a problem for you, not only in practical uh, terms, how to situate yourself in, in a discipline, but also, for instance, the difference between using and, and designing a tool. Because all of that, in some ways, the, the public of the, of the book might be the designers of algorithm, but understood that users are also co-designers. That's why it's so written for users. For users, but not for consumers. For users as participants of uh, not only the algorithms them, themselves, but what's important, what matters to them, how they contribute to building these situations, and how they contribute to the culture around, uh, around Giphy, for instance. So that's why, in, in some sense, it has, it has to be understandable for a very wide public, and that, that was a project of the, of the book. Of course, this challenge is the idea that it's a specific genre, but maybe that is a genre. Now, I, I don't know how many people can be that transversal. Yes, thanks. I mean, I, of course, I, I, I don't think it's, it's really like necessary to you know, like follow a genre, but I'm kind of like wondering whether there is indeed like, a, like, like an emergent genre that, that also, because at one point in your presentation, you said, you know, that you don't want to be normative. Um, I mean, there was, of course, apropos a particular, a very particular um, uh, element, but but I do think that the, the thesis does combine you know, analytical elements and, and normative elements um, quite, quite strongly, right? So there is clearly an overall normative direction, right? That suggests that, you know, visual network analysis like, should be done in a, in, in a certain way. So maybe I can just, as a, as a, maybe a, a, you know, footnote question to the first one, ask, how do you connect this kind of, the, you know, the analysis of existing practice and then, you know, kind of the recommendations, right? It doesn't have to be requirements, but the suggestions and recommendations that you're making. I think that the, the honest answer here is that I, the process of the PhD changed me. Um, and it came from, from the STS literature, and, but also from the reflection itself. I think I, I came with a pretty normative way of thinking of things. For instance, because you see obvious errors that they do seem obvious to you and then, well, you want to fix them maybe. Now, when you look closely, more closely at the, at the practices, maybe from an anthropological angle, you, you realize that what people try to achieve is not what you thought. It, it is different from what you, you thought and then you are less and less in a position to judge them as making a mistake and more and more to understand that they have different goals and then they have different ways and they have different problems and as what you thought and that explains to some extent what they do. And then you're not so sure that your version of the thing was good. And I think it's very important as a tool maker to be able to admit that people might be right to misuse your tool in some ways. And th th I mean, there is, an there is an effect here when you've designed, you've put a lot of effort into certain features that are producing unexpected effects, you, you are attached to that. So that's why it's maybe more difficult when it's your tool than when it's someone else's tool. But at the same time, you're in the best position to intervene because it's your tool. So you have the, the most potential to change things. 
So I think that maybe you can feel it. I think that the, the parts of the thesis were written in a certain style and I reworked a number of things. For instance, unblackboxing Giphy was one of the oldest papers, the earliest written papers of the thesis. Now I'm rewriting it after peer review for science as culture and, and with Emilia. And we've changed a number of things without really changing the core of the argument, but the way I explain and think of these different things is quite different now. And that's the effect, that's an effect of all the learning, the thinking of the, of a certain STS perspective into my work and the integration of something that comes from kind of the natural quantitative sciences that are fed to the engineer and that have always been present in me and other sensitivities that correspond to other, other parts of my sensitivity. For instance, the visual part, because as you can see, one of the key features of the city, it's, it's very visual. So in some ways, the visual, because it's nonverbal, it has helped me see things otherwise. I don't know how to say that. Maybe I'm a little bit lost here, but what I want to say is that for sure, it was a process, it's not over. So in some ways, I still see in some places that are I have been more normative that if it were for me to rewrite all of that now, I would be less more normative. And I'm not completely disintoxicated, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I think maybe following up from here, I would also like to ask you a bit more about, about Giffy and, 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 and your relation to it, right? Um, because it's quite interesting. When you talk about Giffy, uh, you often you know, use all kinds of terms, but you often use, for example, the term tinkering, but you also describe it then as a distributed laboratory, right? Um, and you also call yourself an engineer, a designer, but then most importantly, a toolmaker. Um, so, so maybe like wh why use that term, uh, which yeah, evokes um, you know like craft and 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 uh, artisanship more than say a mathematics and uh, and computer science. Um, why assume the stance of the toolmaker in the thesis? And um, maybe like how do you think about this in in relation to to social science? Um, uh, yeah. So I think first that. The reason why I use the word tool is because it's to confer a form of unity to Giphy that may um, in some ways clash with the, the multiplicity that I also pretend it is. But nevertheless, I would say it's a tool because it is designed and branded as a single thing. And this is um, in some ways, a, a communication strategy, but this is it, this has a very important impact into the way it is perceived, positive and negative. I think it is, it's in, it incentivizes people to delegate a number of things to that. I want to say that to contrast it with what it is to, for instance, write a code library. You write a code library, you will name that with a complex name like IPX to Z. Uh, you, you, you host that, you publish a paper, people may use it and maybe another library is published later on that replaces that one by someone else. And this is a much more continuous way to contribute to equipping people that we could also call tool making. But what's weird in that case is that a library is not a tool. And this is, this is very important because a dichotomy that I, I don't want to enforce, maybe that's a mistake to, to use the word tool then, but a, a mistake, um, yeah, a dichotomy I don't want to enforce is um, between something that would be open-ended, like a library can be because it's made to connect to other libraries and to be convoked, for instance, in a notebook, while a tool is in some way ready-made. And this is very important in the way uh, the tools are produced. So of course, I, I've said earlier that it changes the way they are appropriated by user, but that's just one part of the problem. And for me, as a toolmaker, that's why I say as a toolmaker, the other part is very important. So if we want to equip the social sciences and produce new scientific instruments, how do we have, for instance, institutions like, like universities acknowledge that this is scientific work, that it has some needs, like does this university even know that some people, and not speaking of myself, but other people, that they produce tools? Do they, do they have a system to list their tools the way they do with papers? Like if you want to exist in this sphere that is about funding, 
the dynamic of the academia, the way you get a DOI, you're cited, and so on. If you want to do that, you have to exist as an entity, and then you've got to be a tool. That's why if you're, for instance, a very well-installed uh, author in the academia, we will tend to refrain from presenting yourself as a tool maker because it's more productive for you to hide your code and still publish, but to, to brand yourself as an academic. While if you're bad at writing because you were an engineer first, the only way you have to get valorized in the academia is to present yourself as a tool maker. And I want to uh, inspire these people and to show that maybe there is a way we can make um, the fact of building open source tools in science a more accepted practice in the norms of the academia. That's my, that's my agenda here. And that's where I want to say I'm a tool maker. The, the audience, the audience applauds. Um, with that, uh, the two the two makers in the audience, uh, uh, you know, are are happy with that uh, that explanation. Um, maybe my next question is a bit more uh, specific, uh, going into uh, uh, you know more detail of, uh, of of your thesis. And and I was wondering, you know, while the text translating uh, uh, networks that you co-wrote with uh, uh, Martin Grandjean um, does indeed uh, thematize the relationship between network statistics and visual network analysis to a certain degree. Um, the issue is not discussed in greater depth in the thesis, I find. I mean, you do establish context by discussing, you know, network science, social network analysis, network analysis, but there is no like systematic comparison and contrasting of statistical network analysis and visual network analysis with regard to analytical practice, right? Um, so one could ask, you know, what do we see when we look at or through, through statistics? Uh, like you ask, you know, what do we see when we look at uh, at networks? So what kinds of uh, uh, mediation instrument uh, are statistics, right? And where is the, the contrast with, um, with uh, the visual mode? So it seems like the relationship between these two modes of apprehension of networks is important, particularly from a, from a research perspective. Um, but I mean, this is not so much a, like a, a criticism, right? Since the, the thesis is already like, like doing so much and, and it's a, well, quite long. Um, but I'm also, you know, just wondering, um, you know, how you think about this issue. I think that there are two interesting things to say beyond uh, the fact that you have to choose at some point and, and it was editorially less fit with the rest that was more visual. The two things that are more interesting to say is, first of all, if you go that route, the first thing you will realize is that most of the metrics that are used, the centrality metrics, they kind of do the same thing even though they are framed differently from what they express or what they represent. So very quickly, you realize that they are not as different as they seem, except a few are very different. And, and in one in particular is so important because it connects to the visual is what are the bridges? Because between nest centrality is a very different centrality matrix than on the other hand, page rank, heats, degree, a number of things that are quite like each other with a, a number of nuances. Between a centrality, which finds the bridges, is very different. And the question of bridges is the same question of the groups. It's, and, and so I didn't find something productive to say about that, and that's one of the reasons why um, I didn't choose to go that route. If I had found a definitive way, I was almost to the point to, to succeed, maybe. I want to do that soon. If I can express what a bridge is, we've tried with Pablo... Uh, Jensen and Tomaso Venturini, we've, we've written a paper on that. Then I would go that way. And then this, the second thing that is interesting to say about it is that there is a whole bunch of discourses in the academic literature about what each centrality metric, not all metrics are about centrality, but let's focus on that. Uh, like, is it about notoriety or is it about um, having a certain position in the network? There are a lot of things that are similar but different and then People from social network analysis, for instance, they have a lot of different reasons to use one rather than another because it has different roots and different theories of the social, for instance. And then there is what these, considering that these centrality metrics exist, how they, are they then repurposed by other people? I think that this is very interesting, but it requires even more work because then you have to do kind of field work specifically about what people do with centrality metrics with different tools and the literature is huge about that. 
So it, it was a too big chunk for me, but that's definitely worth doing. Maybe that's something we could work on with, with Martin in the future. Who knows? Yeah, thank you. Um, um, I, you know, I, I also think that, that from a practitioner's perspective and, and to kind of like underscore that pedagogical component, I think it would really be um, like, like, like useful, right, to, um, to uh, 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 you know, to apply the same pedagogical spirit, uh, uh, you know, to this kind of like broader, broader practice of, as well. Um, I think I have time for one last question. Um, which is which is a very practical question. Um, I, I was wondering. You 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 certainly know um, the, the the field notes plugin um, for uh, for Gephi that comes out of um, out of the Utrecht Data School, yes. um, and that is also an attempt to uh, uh, you know to hold Gephi accountable, right? And, and and I was just curious what you what you think about um, uh, uh, that these kind of efforts because. My, my impression is that your own approach to accountability is really quite different. Um, well, that's why I'm interested in the comparison. Mm. So first of all, let me acknowledge that the, the field note plugin, uh, just for the audience to explain, basically every basic action you would do in Giphy is then logged so that you can retrace everything you've done. So similar devices exist, for instance, in Photoshop, and they are even active in the sense that you can even go back and, and then use another branch to do a different course of actions. It also exists basically in the same way in, in um, um, what's called open refine. But what's important is that even without a very active integration into the tool, the fact that you have the list of things you've done helps you uh, account for um, w where the, the results you've produced come from. And this is very good uh, endeavor. And that, that's a direction that's worth uh, pursuing, of course. So I completely support that. I think that the spirit is very good. But I also don't think that it's the only way it can be, you can, you can support accountability. So you're right that there are, I also think there are other ways, especially what I don't like so much about that is that it's very embedded into a, a social science practice with, that is not that of many people, like data journalists, they may want another thing because they are even more time constrained or whatever. So having a bunch of text is one way to do it. There are other ways. For instance, Giphy also lacks the ability to export a legend to the visualizations, that's because it's so complicated to do, but it would be worth it, worth doing too. So the, the issue with the, with the field notes plugin, it's more like on the practical side. Uh, it lacks enough engineering, so that, that would be kind of our job to integrate it more. But then when, where it gets interesting and interesting, and I don't want, I just want to touch that subject without engaging with it, is that it has to do with what is a basic action in Giphy, because you can't log everything. You have to choose what's worth putting there. And that's actually a, a pretty deep question also about the architecture of Giphy. And that's where the, the needs of the user and the internal logic of the tool designer meet at quite a very transversal level. So that would be work, a data sprint or a workshop by itself that, would, that I would very much uh, have. Thanks, I think uh, my time is up, so... Um... Thank you, Thank Bernard. You, Chapeau, hein? Merci.